Hello, welcome to the uh, first lesson for chapter six. The topic of the chapter is sin and forgiveness. Um, here you can see the pages we're going to cover in your book. Please look at two, uh, two five, um, where it lists the capital sins, or you might know them as the um, seven deadly sins. Um, look at the definition of sin on two twenty six, then two. 31 through 238, the Bible on sin, uh, then 239 through 246, the different types of sin. This is what we're going to cover today. 249 through 253, the idea of conversion and the sacrament of reconciliation. So this is lesson one, <clears throat> and I'm going to in a different order than the book. I'm going to start by um, defining sin and our warm-up is classwork 6.25, the sin of omission. So if you are absent, um, please double check with uh, me as to whether or not you need to make this up. Um, we're going to be looking at a poem and seeing how this artistic form of poetry can enlighten our understanding of sin. So let me share you where it is on Schoology. It's classwork 6.5. Oh, first... Let me do the learning objectives. Um, our learning objectives are to define the different types of sin. We're going to define um, sins of omission, which we're going to do right now in the warm-up. Original sin, personal sin, mortal sin, venial sin, and social sin. And by the end, you should be able to give examples of each of these types of sin. So let's go back to that warm-up. So for chapter... Whoops. Uh-oh, it logged me out. One moment. So let's go down. Come on. Uh, and I'll show you where we're working on Schoology. We're going to be in the black folder, Unit 2, Morality, Chapter 6, Sin and Forgiveness. <clears throat> if you hear noise in the background, it's my kids. And then the red folder, Classwork and Discussions. And we're going to do 6.25, Sin of Omission. So if you open this PDF, um, here you see the poem. Um, and you're going to read this poem. And then there's just two brief reflection questions. First, what are some good works that you may have neglected to do in the past? It's missing a T there. That you would now like to return to and not leave undone and then the this is missing a, a word here this should be the poem focuses on simple individual acts that we leave undone what are some of the signs of uh, some of the sins sorry of omission that occur on a larger scale what are the sins of omission that communities commit so um for example uh, you know, who's getting left behind in our societies? The poor, um, children, women. What are some evidences of sins of omission that are happening on a larger scale? So please answer those and then upload this to Schoology. So first of all, Catholics um, teach that not all sins are the same. That's why we're able to define many different types of sin. So, for example, we have here a quote from uh, the letter of 1 John. And he writes, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. So clearly what the author of Scripture is saying is that some sins lead to death and others don't. Some are worse than, some sins are worse than other sins. Um, and up here we have for... From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These defile a person. So those are the words of Jesus. Um, and he talks about at the end of the day, sin comes from our heart. Um, and it's when our hearts are not oriented toward God that we sin. So the catechism of the Catholic Church um, is going to distinguish between different kinds of sins according to these various um, uh, categories. Their objects, remember, that's the moral act. So um, obviously I think it's common sense to say that 
there is a big difference between gossiping about someone and, say, killing them. Um, the virtues they oppose. So um, some virtues are, are more fundamental than others. Um, the commandments they violate. So again, the commandments say, um, you know, to honor your father and mother, you should be respectful of your parents. But again, it's a lot worse to say sass your mom than lying under oath in court. Whether or not, whether they concern God, neighbor, or oneself. So um, one can think of the sin of masturbation is a sin against oneself. Um, but then the sin of adultery is a sin against God who you promised uh, your marriage to, to your neighbor, to your spouse, and uh, a sin against oneself. So some sins violate um, uh, different people to greater or lesser extents. Um, whether they deal with the spirit or with the body. And then finally, whether they are sins in thought, word, deed, or a failure to act. So, uh, again, it's just common sense that, um, you know, one might, uh, I, I guess using the example I just used, adultery, one might think lustful thoughts about someone who's not their spouse. That's a big difference just thinking about it and then doing it. Although Jesus warns us that the thoughts are where it starts. People don't go out and have affairs without thinking about it for a long time first. So let's take a closer look at some of the different types of sin. So first, original sin. Remember that original sin is a condition. Um, it's not an act we do. So personal sin is um, when an individual chooses um, to turn away from God. So the sin of Adam and Eve, um, their original sin was their personal sin, but it led to this condition we call original sin. So original sin is a condition we inherit from our first parents. Um, and it leaves us with a weakened human nature. So this was a really nice, um, concise quote from your book, so I chose to include it. Wounded in the natural powers proper to it. So again, there's a right way and a wrong way, a proper way and an improper way. Um, subject to ignorance, suffering in the dominion of death, and in inclined to sin. That's what original sin is. Um an inclination to evil that's called concupiscence. Baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns a man back to God. Um, but the consequences for nature, weakened and inclined to evil, persist in man and summon him to spiritual battle. So original sin was erased by baptism. That's when we got sanct... Oh, let me choose a different color. You can't see it. Um, sanctifying grace, and that erases original sin, but concupiscence, the inclination to sin, still remains. Our human nature was damaged to such an extent that, um, you know, that we're permanently broken. It's like uh, original, it's like sanctifying grace. We had a wound. And it sewed up the wound, but we still have the scar of concupiscence. And um, if we are honest with ourselves, this makes a lot of sense. It explains why human beings, when left to their own devices, seem to choose evil over good so often. Um, it's because we are weak and we're broken and we need grace and we need help. <clears throat> Next is mortal sin. So um, the three... Defining characteristics of mortal sin are here. Um, first, it has to be grave matter. Grave means serious. So the moral object, again, that's the act you want, you're going to do, must be serious enough to destroy God's love within us. So your heart um, only has so much room in it. Mortal sins, what they do to us, is they push all of God's grace out. So as Catholics, we believe that even if you've been baptized, if you commit a mortal sin, mortal sins and grace are like oil and water. They can't be in the same place at the same time. So very serious sins destroy God's love in our heart. It pushes it out and... Um, 
so for that reason, we have to, the only way to, to cure this soul sickness is to get the sacrament of reconciliation. So if you're asking yourself, what's a mortal sin? How do I know? Generally speaking, a good guidepost is the Ten Commandments. Um, those are the basics of natural moral law. To violate them very often constitutes a grave sin. But um, one of the reasons the sacrament of reconciliation is so important and so meaningful is sometimes we don't know what's a serious sin and what's not. Um, for example, some of the examples they gave in your book of venial sins, I thought were serious sins. Um, but uh, in any case, if you're not sure, don't leave it up to chance. Go to confession and confess it. Um, so that not only has to be grave and serious, you have to do it, whoops, oh, what am I doing? Um, you have to do it with full knowledge. So we must know that what we're doing is seriously wrong. So, um, sometimes people will commit sins and they didn't, they were just ignorant and they didn't know what they were doing was a sin. So, um, if we're ignorant of a particular wrong through no, no fault of our own, um, then our blameworthiness for a particular action may be diminished or removed. So, for example, I've told you guys the example that my sister talked about when she was deployed to Iraq. The um, insurgents would put hand grenades on their children and have them walk into uh, military bases uh, for the purpose of um, killing our, our servicemen through, um, through uh, suicide. And, of course, those children were being told that that was the right thing to do. So it was no fault of their own. So their responsibility would be um, removed. Uh, but remember, pretending to be ignorant doesn't excuse us from sin. So one of the fascinating things about human beings is we can lie to ourselves. Um, being phony would actually make it worse. So um, if you're going to be phony and, and pretend like you didn't know it was wrong, that actually makes you more guilty. Um, so, and again, remember the basic principles of God's law. Those first principles are goods that St. Thomas Aquinas talked about. Those are written on the human heart. So you can't argue that you're ignorant. <clears throat> Finally, complete consent. The person must give full consent of the will. So, for example, if someone breaks into my house and puts a gun to my head and I have to defend myself um, by killing him, I didn't have full consent, consent of my will. I didn't will that that person would die. I'm only willing that I don't die. So, um, you have to, for it to be, for you to be completely blameworthy, you have to have full consent of the will. So, again, mortal sin kills God's charity or love in us and pushes sanctifying grace out of our hearts. And the only way this soul sickness can be healed is with the grace of the sacrament of reconciliation. Grace heals a, a sin-sick soul. And um, we're going to talk more about that in lesson number three. So venial sin. Venial is a word that just means easily forgivable. So um, these are sins that are easily forgiven. They are a partial, partial sorry, rejection of God whereby the charity is weakened but not destroyed in our hearts. So um, examples they give from the book are typically the way these sins manifest themselves is an attachment to some created good but not so serious that it deprives us of sanctifying grace friendship with God, love, or the loss of eternal happiness. So they listed a bunch of examples in your book. Here's the page numbers up here. But they said missing curfew, um, copying someone else's homework. They listed it as a venial sin, which for me, that's mortal. That's lying. You're turning in someone else's work and saying it's your own. But your book says it's venial, maybe because it's only homework and not like a test. Um, and then, like, little white lies, like when your friend says, oh, does this look good on me, and you don't want to hurt her feelings, and you say yes. Um, so the um, advice they give in the book to counteract venial sin is to practice virtue. So you, first of all, have to be aware of what are your vices, um, what, what are the things that, that you stumble in. And anytime you start stumbling on that vice, turn around and do the opposite virtue. So, for example, if you're someone who has the um, virtue, uh, I mean the vice of pride, 
Uh, one thing you could do is um, when you're tempted to brag about what you've done or, you know, maybe you had a really great PR or something or got a lot of home runs in baseball, um, rather than brag about what you've done, compliment someone else. Uh, and that's the, the virtue of humility. And that will, uh, you know, help you to train yourself in the virtues. And the more you train yourself, you'll get to the point where you almost never sin. Um, they don't require confession. All you have to do is, for example, when we do the penitential rite um, at, at, at the beginning of Mass, and when we say either the Kyrie or the Confidior, I confess to you, uh, Almighty God, to you, my brothers and sisters, that um, reason why we do that is that clears us from venial sin before we participate in the liturgy. Or saying the Our Father. Um, uh, when you say, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others, that, that um, absolves you of venial sin. However, it's recommended to go to confession. Um, most priests will say at least once a month is good. Even if you have no mortal sins, the more you go to confession, the more grace you get and the less venial sins you'll commit. And then I found this quote here from C.S. Lewis. I just thought this was interesting. It's from the Screw Tape Letters, and um, it talks about how sometimes small sins, um, even though we don't think they're a big deal, it talks about their cumulative effect. So I just wanted to, to highlight this. He writes, It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, the soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. So again, as Catholics, we believe that, you know, there's a difference between murdering someone and gambling, but um, we don't want to lull ourselves into a false sense of security and think, well, I don't really sin that much. And um, it become a cumulative thing. <clears throat> Next, Next is social sin. And um, sin is, is a personal action, but we're social creatures. He keeps saying that over and over again. Um, and we're responsible when we cre co cooperate in another person's sin. So examples of social sin would be to directly and voluntarily participate in the sins of another so if someone was making fun of another student and you kind of laugh at them or egg them on, um, order, advise, or praise, or approve of the sins of another person. So maybe you, you guys made fun of another classmate and afterward you gave the person a high five and said, oh, that was so funny. Um, not disclosing or stopping the commission of a sin when we're duty bound to do so. So, um, you know, for example, if you're like in the military, we saw this happen during the Vietnam War. There were instances where um, civilians were targeted and the um, uh, soldiers went to the up the chain of command and reported it, but nothing happened. Um, the people in the chain of command just ignored it. So and then protecting evildoers. So, um, yeah, you, you know, if. Uh, you don't protect evildoers, you turn them over to the authorities. So um, the personal sins of individuals, especially when they, when they, um, uh, this should probably be blind, not blind. Wait, maybe it was blind. When they blind individuals and groups to the condition of their sinfulness, often lead to structures of sin in society. So make sure you know this idea, structures of sin. Structures of sin would be institutions within our society that are in and of themselves sinful. An example of that would be institutional racism, like the apartheid that happened in um, South Africa or when in the United States we had separate but equal. We had institutionally, the government set up a school system that was sinful, it was racist. Um, uh, other examples of institutional racism or it, structure of sin would be um, the way we have capital punishment is a legal form of punishment in some states. Um, that's a structure of sin. And it's a social sin. Since we live in a dem democratic society, we are responsible to God for the choices our government makes. Um, so thus, uh, 
is created social sin that is a cycle of sin, violence and injustice caused by individuals on a societal level. And then this is just a quote from Oscar Romero. He's going to be canonized soon. Um, Social sin is the crystallization of the individual sins into permanent structures that keep sin in being and makes its force felt by the majority of the people. And, of course, he lived in South America where the government was very corrupt and he ultimately died a martyr. He was shot while saying mass in his chapel because he stood up for the poor. Um, So... Almost done here. Okay, um, I apologize. My kids are bothering me. So, um, that brings us to the end of the lesson. So, there is a homework assignment for this, um, for today. So, if we go to the Chapter 6 black folder, go to Homework. And it's the Homework 6.1 Bible on Sin. So uh, what you need to do before the next class is um, put this uh, PDF in Notability. And the first part, there are hyperlinks here. I'm not sure if it'll take you to the scriptures themselves. Oh, I guess it will. So uh, you have this PDF. And first you're going to read these various scriptures. And then just summarize the main points of them. It does. This doesn't necessarily need to be in... It should be in your own words. Uh, but this is like bullet points. And then there's these analysis questions down here. One, two... Hang on, let me get my arrow. One, two, three. Oh, come on. Don't let me scroll. Oh, there we go. And then um, number... Four. So um, it also looks in your uh, in has some references to your textbook as well. So um, if you don't have the textbook, get it. It's called um, Our Life in Christ by Pencock. Um, the link is on Schoology to it. But um, you need to do this for homework. And what's going to happen next class is I'm going to expect you to have this done. We're going to discuss it and self correct. So if you come in and it's not finished, you won't. You're not going to have time to do it in class. We're going to talk about this and then move on. So make sure you have that ready for next class. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, thank you.